welcome to the number one Bengals podcast. I am not Daddy O McDuke, and I'm not joined either by Hoji the Electric Smoji. I am just a simple senior intern, John Sheeran, hosting for the first time here, and I believe this is my seventh year with DNH Sports, and it's the first time I'm going without the puppets. You know, I get a break from doing the puppets at the same time as I'm doing the show. It's a lot more liberating for me, but I'm not alone. I'm joined by our co-host, Bridget, who is hopefully going to be less stressed this show, not having to deal with a bunch of HR complaints. Maybe we can get a little bit more out of Bridget because she's not taxed with dealing with any, let's just call it colorful language and whatnot. Bridget, how are you doing? I'm good. We're going to reduce the amount of documentation we have to do today. Um, I think we're going to have a great show. I'm ready. Yeah, Hoji is not here, and I feel like he would love the fact that this is going to be more of a chill, more zen, more peaceful. And that's really what he's all about. Daddy is very high strung. He's really all about his business and everything. He's all about keeping things strict and stuff. No, 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 no. In fact, when I first started the show, it was me, it was me and Hoji really doing it. Daddy was on some type of sabbatical. I don't really know what that deal was, but it was really just me and Hoji going back and forth, chopping it up like that. And I want to get back to those vibes. And in order to do that, also, Bridget, I don't know if you know, our guest today was carefully selected due to the absence not of both Daddy and Hoji. And I don't know if the audience knows this, but we're contractually obligated by Believe to have someone with facial hair be on the show at all times. We just never had to worry about that since at least one of Daddy or Hoji has always been here. So we went out very much like the Bengals and found the best beard possible in none other than Jake Lisko. Uh, and we will get to Jake really quickly, but we want to first talk to you about Brinks.TV, which we are being streamed on right now. Um, recording, you don't have to worry about me making up some random podcast that you're doing. Daddy already gave me than information. It's quite interesting, to, to be honest with you. It's posted by, well, let's see if I'm reading this right, none other than Henry Kissinger. Um, it's called Party Bombs. I'm Don't not really read sure. the notes. Don't read the notes. No, no, no. Wait, I, 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 he's, he didn't give me a lot of information here, but like, I, I don't know if this is about like going, no, oh, sorry, Party Night. Bomb Night? Bomb Night. Bomb Night is what it was. Maybe it's about like you know, alcoholic drinks. I'm a fan of car bombs. I'm a fan of Jaeger bombs. Maybe he's just going out of town. I didn't really know Henry Kissinger vibe like that, but definitely check that out at Brinks.TV and all the other programmings that uh, Courtney heads and runs on Brinks.TV. And uh, yeah, Brinks.TV, where you get DNA sports and all of your other amazing content. We're also on winnow.app backslash DNA sports, where you can ask us questions we can provide you some answers in a very personal sense and you can text uh the number that should be in the description and on, on the screen more of a personal approach to getting in touch with us and providing some special content for the Bengals and whatnot so definitely check that out at winnow.app backslash dnh sports and bridget i believe that we're also contractually obligated to talk about one of our sponsors. So if you want to get into we that. We are. We are contractually obligated to do all kinds of things at, at this podcast, which is why you get all these shenanigans. Um, but we are going to talk today about the free agency, the way the Bengals are building up this team. And I know for Cincinnati fans, it ha as much as we're going to stay Zen today, it has been a roller coaster of a ride the last 24 hours for Cincinnati sports fans in general, I think. Um, so as we think about like Holden Strong, we you, we know tons of people take multivitamins. Uh, we we want to be as strong um, and healthy as possible. We certainly hope that for Joe Burrow this year. And so it's important to choose one that is top quality. So Hoji always talks to us about this one with one scoop of athletic greens. You're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins minerals, superfoods, probiotics, 
and adaptogens to start your day off right. So these are ingredients that support your gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy recovery, focus, all things that can help you kind of weather being a Cincinnati sports fan. Uh, it's also lifestyle friendly, uh, depending whatever your diet, if you're a total meat eater like daddy -o, or totally vegan like Hoji. Whatever you are in between, you're all good. Uh, and there's one gram of sugar and no chemicals or artificial anything. So you can reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, one scoop and one cup of water every day. That's it. So uh, make it easy. Pick Athletic Greens. They're going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D packs, uh, five free travel packs with your first purchase. So all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash believe that's b-l-e-a-v so athleticgreens.com slash believe contractually obligated to also say these statements have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration These products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease but they can help you whether being a cincinnati fan and prepare your strength for what should be one hell of a Bengals season. There's, I, I threw in the language in the absence of Daddy O and Hoji. So, well, you know, you did all of that without passing out. So, I think you're using <laughs> the products better than what Hoji did. But, like you mentioned, we are not joined by Daddy O or Hoji tonight. Uh, I received a text from Hoji. He said the following Village Island emergency uh, stop. I don't know if he knew that he wasn't sending a telegram or a text but whatever the case may be we do not have either of those facial hair um fiends if you will but we do have the next best option in jake lisco so let's bring him out to talk some Bengals free agency jake are you there i'm here i'm here i've just finished my athletic greens thanks for the shout out and and the heads up that these exist they sent me this cool water bottle that says ag on it so i'm um, i'm down even as a green cap See, that's on brand. Know, I love it. I, I very much thought it meant gold, but maybe that's just my periodic table knowledge coming out at the wrong time. But, Jake, very good to have you here. You know, you haven't been on this program in a while. It's been about a year. But just last year, the Bengals were also very active in free agency. And not much has changed. In fact, they've only gotten more aggressive. Last year, they signed Trey Hendrickson Monday night during legal tampering season. This time... 9 a.m. your time when legal tampering opened, we all got a notification for one Adam Schefter saying that the Bengals have stolen one of Tom Brady's blockers and Alex Kappa. Kappa signed a four-year, $35 million deal with the Bengals with $4 million in total incentives, about a $7 million cap hit for this year, about $13 million in cash, but more importantly, a long-term solution to a problem that's plagued the Bengals for about five years now, ever since Kevin Zeidler has left it. They have a right guard and a solid one at that. What were your first impressions about hearing about the Kappa signing? And yeah, yeah. what do you think about it? My first thought was that I, I was following a fake Adam Schefter. Luckily, we have check marks, but the, the Bengals being the first team to have a move announced in the tampering period is, is not something that I expected. It wasn't the most shocking thing of the day to me, John, and, and that was a much more minor move that I've discussed on, on my own podcast or, or on Twitter as well. But I, I was surprised that the Bengals were getting after it so aggressively so early in the process. I was confident going into this week that there would be new starting offensive linemen for the Cincinnati Bengals. I just thought it would take a little bit of time to materialize and they wouldn't be the team this year that had put together a four-year deal in five seconds after the tampering period opened last year. As you mentioned, Trey Hendrickson, they didn't get their first deal done until I think it was 10, 12 p.m. Eastern time. It was when the Trey Hendrickson deal dropped. Instead, I think this time it was 12.02 p.m. I think there were a couple minutes there, but it was really quick. Yeah, it was like I just got back from like, I was just I was just out for a little bit, and I was out because I didn't expect the Bengals to do anything in like the, the those first couple hours, whatnot. Right. But I made sure to get back just in case anything did happen. I know our friend Malik Wright uh, 
had some like little hints out there. I think he was something about Joseph Notebloom that we all kind of assumed involved the Bengals, but that was just him getting the deal at the last minute. And then, yeah, just look down my phone. Oh, it's noon. Oh, it's Adam Schefter. Oh, he's got the hashtag Bengals in there. Of course, leading up to free agency, Bridget, the whole speculation was about Ryan Jensen, right? He was like the top target, speculatively the top target for the Bengals in free agency. And then Ryan Jensen goes back to Tampa Bay as soon as Tom Brady announces his unretirement. We don't know what type of deal the Bengals would have offered Ryan Jensen had he been available, but in terms of total money, might not have been too far off from what Alex Kappa got. So in terms of like an alternative, say that Jensen was in the plans and that they ended up with Kappa, arguably a bigger position of need for the Bengals. Does that signing with Kappa make up for the potential loss of what could have been Ryan Jensen? So I feel like this is my question to you all and and we're even with the deal. So that's what I, you two are the encyclopedias. I am the like watching Twitter, trying to figure everything out. I feel like I want to turn that question back to you all, but also like with this deal, like where do you think that positions the Bengals for the, and I know we'll talk about the rest of the O-line a little bit and where we still need to build um, or, you know, who who we've already signed in addition. But where do you all think this deal positions us or what do you think we still need to do? Well, the fact that they got arguably their biggest need on offensive line secured with, again, a very solid player, I think that bodes well going forward. You know, anybody over who they had at right guard last year is fun, is a monumental upgrade. No offense to Akeem Adeniji, but he's just not hes just not at the position. That's not his position, and that's just not where he was best at. Yeah, the and sacks other, allowed are crazy when you compare. Yeah, 100%. Like, uh, out of every starting right guard, he was amongst the very worst. And what you can say what you want about Kappa, he might not be amongst the top five or ten at the position, but he's not too far off from that. And the whole thing with the Bengals and what they like to do is that they bring in these free agents who they feel like are on the up and up. And I feel like Kappa kind of qualifies with that. I think a, a, a lot of it is similar to uh, Trey Hendrickson and Chidabi Awuzie, guys who were decent during their rookie contracts with their original teams, but you didn't expect them to elevate their games into what they were last year. And maybe that is the hope with Alex Kappa, you know, a guy who doesn't have a ton of athletic upside, but he's he's stable and he's solid and that's something that you can that, that's something that you should value in terms of monetary value if you will so yeah i think that the idea is that he gets better going forward and pre, pre, you know presents them even more value with the money that he's making but just as a guy that you can fill that spot for three to four years for not a lot of money it sets them up to build the rest of the offense line well and also it allows them more flexibility in terms of the cap to fill some other positions and Jake that's just something that we know the Bengals like to do they don't like to fill one position with a top tier elite guy for a lot of money they would prefer to spread that money out a little bit more equally to fill in as many holes as possible yeah someone's I think gotta make, is it, sorry Jake I'm just someone's got to make that they're not hitting their salary cap a joke right has anyone made it yet if not I'm putting my stake in the ground I think we have a few weeks until they they eventually because they will spend more money and then we can make the joke but I'm not but, spending the salary kappa. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But they spent some of their salary cap on kappa. I, I think, John, to your point, you compare it to Brandon Scherf. Scherf gets 16 million a year. Karis and Kappa together are making less than 16 million a year compared to Joe Tooney's deal last year, similar deal to what, what Scherf got. And so, like they did at corner last year, where William Jackson goes and gets 14 million and they get two guys that combine to be less than 14 or about 14 million a year. They, they kind of take that same approach for two, for two interior offensive linemen. And like you said, John, they're getting guys that they think will stabilize the position. I'm sure they think Kappa has been improving year over year coming from Humboldt state, which no longer has a football program, uh, a very small school wins with technique, as you said, not the most athletic, but has remade his body to play on the inside in the NFL, got a lot stronger. It, it is impossible to say that the move doesn't make them significantly better in the immediate future. And it looks like we'll talk about later. It, it sets them up pretty clearly to me to address one more, at least one more starting position on the offensive line. Very glad you mentioned Humboldt State because while it does no longer have a football program, 
it did teach Steven Hillenburg a lot about what he ended up creating in the cartoon SpongeBob SquarePants. Shout out Humboldt State for all of your value in society. But you did mention another name, and you are the king of segues, Jake. Let's talk a little bit about Ted Karras, who was signed by the Bengals two hours after they reached an agreement with Alex Kappa. Three years, $18 million, another very modest deal, another very Bengals-like deal for one of their priority free agents. Comes in with guard and center versatility. He most recently played left and right guard, but when he first started playing extended snaps in the NFL, it was at center with both the Patriots and the Miami Dolphins. I think a lot the consensus regarding the positives with Karras is that he's also a very stable player. He may not be on the ascending plane that Alex Kappa is because he's a little bit older, maybe still has similar athletic limitations and whatnot, but you know exactly what you're getting in Karras, and it's a guy that the Patriots probably didn't want to lose but didn't think that he would command as much money as he ended up doing so. He's now 29 years old on this exact day. Happy birthday, Mr. Karras. But he comes in with that positional versatility, and assuming that the team does eventually move on from Trey Hopkins, the logic states that he's likely going to be at center, but we don't know that yet because free agency has yet to be finalized. The draft has not been here yet. So when you hear Ted Karras with the Bengals offensive line, does center just make too much sense or are we too early to pigeonhole him at that spot? A lot of people are talking about Ted Karras playing left guard, about going after J.C. Treader, about positional versatility, about enabling them to go pick Tyler Linderbaum if he falls to 31 in the draft. And Tyler Linderbaum would be the only center that I think you would consider at that point. But I think that currently, at least, you can pencil him in at center. There may be some kick in the tires for J.C. Treader. I would give that long odds. So I think he's a center. I think that they want one of their young guys, Jackson Carmen, Deontay Smith, and maybe Quentin Spain is even back in the mix to provide some veteran ability at left guard on, on another one-year kind of deal. They want one of those guys to step up and win the left guard job. I would be very surprised if the Bengals go out and signed four new starting offensive linemen in free agency. There would even be some out there that call Ted Karras a, a very, very good backup, like a super backup, a utility guy, first guy off the bench kind of thing. But I think he's totally capable of starting as well and – John, you mentioned Trey Hopkins, who who we've kind of assumed at least for a couple of weeks now, going back to the combine as a likely cut candidate. He kind of got the same deal that the Bengals formerly gave Hopkins, and you would think that that will replace itself. And Hopkins might be back, but even if he is, it seems like to me the plan would be for Karras to be playing center based on what I've heard so far. And that leaves one big spot, I think, for them to address for a starter in free agency. Yeah, I think we... We want, you know, secretly to not maybe not so secretly, but we selfishly want like four new additions on the offensive line, and that's still, I guess, possible. But considering the money that they have left, the other positions that they need, the fact that they eventually need to get to 85, 90 guys on the roster, it's probably not in the likely plans, at least for like a high impact fourth addition to the offensive line. I think we can all think that another one is eventually coming. And maybe he will also share the similarity that Kappa and Karras have and that they both played for Tom Brady. And Bridget, I think that's an interesting thing that people have brought up, the fact that you know this guy, Joe Burrow, has been compared to Tom Brady on, on numerous occasions. And you have two veteran offensive linemen that know what that's like and know what comes with that. And you even had Alex Kappa turn down a potential reunion with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to go join the Bengals. And we don't know if that just happened too late or whatnot, but... That decision was made, and Karras turned down a smaller deal to stay with the Patriots to go play with this guy in Joe Burrow. Like, What do you think that that means to other potential free agents who see these two very well-established guys decide to play with a guy who they maybe reminds them a lot about their former quarterback? I mean, we're seeing what Bengals fans got a preview and into all of this past season, right? The cultures here that we've got a, a guy and Joey franchise, and I'll, I'm going to use that term for our um, departing CJ Uzama, who will will tip our hats to and pour one out for um, a little later in the show. But it, this guy stands for something. This guy is showing us what he's about. And I think people want to want to be around that. It's not just, you know, we saw it in the receiver core this year. And I, I mean, we heard about it. I 
live not too far from the precinct in Cincinnati, and I heard the the O line went there often for uh, for dinners. I, I'm curious as we think about the the culture, and I mean the O line for better and for worse had a strong culture and had a great relationship with Joe Burrow. How would you both rate these two? Like if you were grading the Bengals on these two O line signings like what would you say how would you grade the Bengals right now I, I think both the athletic and over the cap Jason I believe, forget his last name but I think they both rated these signings as like B B plus which I believe is about right people are very entrenched with the idea of doing whatever you can to go out and protect Joe Burrow like leave, leave no stone unturned go out and spend as much money as possible this is what matters, but that's never going to be the Bengals, even for offensive line. They will always look for value. They will look for quality players, but they won't go out of their way to overspend cough, cough Jaguars, right? That's never going to be them. So I think that that might cost you like the highest quality of players, but it leaves you with continued cap flexibility. It, it, they, they remain stagnant with their principles and whatnot, but they still provide quality talent, even though they may not be the perfect scheme fits i think you know J jake you can kind of touch on this like kappa and karis they have more experience you know blocking and gap schemes and that could affect what they do going forward schematically even though you know we can discern from frank pollock's comics that he doesn't want to change too much but i think for the value that they're getting like the price tag and the quality of players it's about a b plus and i think that's a very objective way to look at it compared to everything else in free agency yeah i think the individual moves I would give probably B's. The individual moves are fine. They didn't overpay. They got quality players. They're not the best players that were available, but they also didn't overpay for controversial players. I know, John, you're still waiting for that polarizing contract <laughs> that the Bengals will sign a free agent to. Neither of these are that, although Ted Karras might be close. Uh, I think that they probably paid him more than other teams might have. The, the reports were that Compared to the three years, 18 million he got from Cincinnati, the offer from the Patriots was three years, 15, which was then lowered to three years, uh, 13. I had heard that he thought that he would be able to get to 7 million a year. He takes 6 million a year from the Bengals. So uh, it's, it's within, I think, reasonable parameters. But I think that it's one of those where the sum is greater than, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because of the improvement that we'll see on the offensive line from adding two stable pieces and the improvement that we'll see in Joe Burrow's game from adding two stable pieces, the, the pass blocking between these two. And, and I know that Trey Hopkins wasn't a major liability in this way, but should really improve. And when they get to that right tackle position as well, you're talking about three major improvements on the offensive line. And the thing about offensive linemen is for the most part, you don't need to be, the best on the offensive line. You just need to be average to above average. The Bengals well below average for most of last year, if not all of last year, at most of the, the spots on the offensive line. And so getting to that average mark makes a, a much larger impact from going from poor to average makes a larger impact than going from average to elite. And this is what we talked about last year when the Bengals had the uh, Jamar Chase Penny Sewell debate, the Bengals took steps to get toward average. And I think that's very important. You talked a little bit about scheme, John. I wouldn't be surprised to see them go to a little bit more of a variable scheme. I don't think that Joe Burrow was entirely comfortable with some of the stuff they ran off of wide zone in the passing game, the the boots and the the wide zone play action. It didn't look like he was terribly confident, like I said, in turning his back to his line of scrimmage. Certainly wasn't as efficient there, although there were, were big plays to be had. We could see a little bit of a change there, but like you mentioned, uh, Frank Pollock seems to want to keep doing the things that he wants to do. I do think that there is good enough scheme versatility in these guys compared to what they have before. You think about Quentin Spain, not the best wide zone guard, although he might be back. Same could be said for Alex Kappa. And so kind of a lateral move there in terms of athleticism. And Ted Karras, I think, does enough to be a functional center in a wide zone game. So they could keep those elements if that is their direction yeah i think again like i think you hit the nail on the head there individually like they're solid players like they're solid signings but overall the offensive line gets improved even though 
again, a fully healthy Trey Hopkins is probably fine, but you're getting at least two more years out of Ted Karras compared to Trey Hopkins playing on the last year of his deal. The offensive line got better. We can't really say the same about the defensive line as of right now because they lost, while they lost Larry Ogunjobi to the Chicago Bears, who signed a three-year, $40.5 million deal, they were fortunate enough to retain one B.J. Hill on a three-year, $30 million deal. B.J. Hill is expected now to start full-time at three technique, which is how he finished the year when Larry Ogunjobi was nursing that, that foot injury that ended his season prematurely and like this was the expectation right Bridget like if they were going to lose Larry to a deal that was expected to be much outside of the price range they were going to everyone in Paul Byrne Stadium the executives the lunch ladies the janitors they're all going to focus their attention on bringing back BJ Hill if they lose BJ Hill who knows where they are where they're at with defensive tackle they don't have anyone else who could fill that spot they would have had to be desperate elsewhere in free agency or maybe just have to spend that first round pick on a defensive tackle so BJ Hill is back and based off of what he said you know kind of in this press conference after the signing i could honestly see him emerging as a leader to replace maybe the voice that they lost in cj uzama it's very you know much of a projection on my part but i see him now being part of the team long term and kind of ascending into that role now that he has some type of stability and some type of security and also he's a really good player that it's earned a lot of the respect in that locker room I'm sure everyone is very interested in my BJ Hill story was which is that I was in Kansas City for the AFC Championship game and was in the bathroom during his interception um which is like my least favorite memory of this season I'm like how did uh how did that whole series go down um and I missed BJ Hill's interception and the line was so long that I also missed the touchdown and the two point conversion. So I figured everyone would need to know my, um, my most relevant BJ Hill memory from this season. Well, my cousin, who's a big avid OSU fan, he's notorious for, um, going away from the TV and having great things happen to him, uh, while he's, well, great things happen to the team while he's not watching the game currently. So I don't know if you got some of that from him or you, that's just something that's also special in your genetic code but it sounds like the fact that you left the stands of the Chiefs game is also why the Bengals ended up winning that game that might be my dad listens every week and he is that energy for the Bengals he is not allowed to watch the games um he I didn't let him watch the Super Bowl and maybe I should have let him watch the Super Bowl but yes that could be very deeply embedded in the genetic code. <laughs> Jake, BJ Hill's back. My my most important question for you, because I don't really know the answer to this. Um, I know that his celebration is called like Rock the Baby, but I, I honestly think that it's more like him sway, swaying his belly. Like that's honestly just what it looks like to me. And the fact that like it doesn't look right when everyone else does it. You know, you have Sam Hubbard emulating it. You have DJ Reader emulating it sometimes. Like it, it looks... It, just tell me it looks more like he's like was like swaying his baby a little bit because like it, it it's too too hard of a rock you know like you're gonna wake the baby up well he's he's pretty hyped up man sometimes when your adrenaline's going you rock the baby too hard and that's to the baby's detriment so hopefully the baby said you know his new profile picture is him rocking jermaine pratt is the baby so that beef is funny I don't like. I, I know they were both NC State boys. I think they came out. I, Pratt was 2019. Hill was 2018. But I guess they they really bonded as Wolfpacks. But I think that was like how. I, I think that was how I found out that the signing was official. It was like Jermaine Pratt said, like, "Congrats, boy! Now like stop crying or something like that." Oh, stop, I thought he stop said putting five dollars a gas. Yeah. yeah, you can fill up now, BJ. Congratulations. Well, shit. I mean, five dollars it gets you one gallon now. So I don't know how he was getting around at that point. He got a lot of money this year, though, man. That this is the Bengals' biggest cash signing so far, and I thought it would be an external guy. Fifteen million in cash in year one to BJ Hill is the fourth most in year one cash to a non-rookie, non-franchise player. I think in team history, behind only DJ Reader, Trey Waynes, and Trey Hendrickson. So, guy got paid. And who knows if that was because Larry left. Maybe that was just added leverage that BJ had at that point. But Bridget, I'm gonna I'm about to, I'm about to make Jake's day because I have the financials for BJ Hill's contract. I saw that, yeah. 
Dang it. I thought I was going to break that to you. <laughs> Very excited for it, but I, I did see it. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Jake, you want to you wanna spoil my surprise? No, no go ahead. You, you've got it. Oh, okay. So, uh, BJ Hill's three-year $30 million deal comes with a $10 million signing bonus and a $3 million roster bonus for this year. That's how they... Like they're going to include that with the guarantees, but that is a cap hit of 8.33, repeating, of course, million this year, which puts their cap space at just about, what, 14 million? Just around there? Yeah, I actually am not really keeping track of what the actual number is because I'm just assuming that the Trey Waynes and Trey Hendrickson cuts are coming. So I guess it would be my number, which I've currently got it at... Uh, 29 minus the 10 or minus 11 minus six. So whatever that works out to what's 29 minus 16. Sounds like 13 to me. 13. That, that's, that's yeah. roughly where I would have it right now. So there's space to be had now that BJ Hills back into the fold. We don't know really what else they're going to do at defensive line. It kind of feels like at this point you have the starters there you have a lot of money allocated to that position group. You have Joseph Asai coming back from injury, but maybe they could do a little bit more to kind of bolster the edge. But really, like to me, it just seems like they, they loved having Larry play in tandem with BJ and have those guys rotate them out. And I think just having both those guys fresh for most of the year, it really uh, did wonders for them and maybe even aided in some of that production. So I think they're comfortable with Hill as the starter to play the role that Ogan Joby had. But, I mean, I, I don't think it would surprise anybody, Jake, if they tried to add more of an explosive pass rusher to complement Hill and kind of reintegrate that element that they lost in Ogan Joby. Yeah, and I think that's going to come in the draft. I don't think that guy is out there in free agency. It's not a very good free agency group of defensive linemen, with, which I think contributes to the big year one cash flow for, for B.J. Hill, that $15 million. I think he might have been the best available defensive lineman when they brought him back on the interior. So I, I agree with you, John. I think that they are looking for something there. I'm not sure if it's going to be a pick 31. Maybe it's on day two. I, I do think, though, that we might see a more defense-heavy draft than we've seen the last few years, especially if they do what I think they're going to do and, and find another starter at right tackle. But you're right. I think they're they're probably looking for somewhere, whether it's uh, in addition to Joseph Osai, I think, coming back for, for a little bit more pass rush juice because there were times when, despite the sack totals and the pressure totals, that it was the coverage unit that was earning those sacks and pressures and so I think they're looking for a little bit more production and a little bit quicker production out of their front four. Yeah, and they definitely need younger defensive talent to come through the draft. They've spent a lot of early picks on the offense, so they need to kind of turn that attention to the defense. But we could also see a tight end be picked relatively high. It's a decent tight end draft class. And the reason behind that, man, it broke Bridges' heart. CJ Uzama oh, has agreed to a three-year deal, $24 million with the New York Jets. He gets to go to the Meadowlands, be closer to NFL media headquarters, maybe to potentially start building or continuing to build his post-playing career in the media. But, you know, the, the thing about CJ to me is that the fact that he was here, you know, he was a rookie for 2015. He wasn't really involved on the field much for that, for that run to the playoffs. But then he was witness and a starter for most of the five years that followed of just being completely awful. And I, I, I don't personally remember him being this outspoken leader before they made this run this past year, but everyone remembers even back to training camp, you know, just him galvanizing the entire locker room, starting the why not us movement. And, you know, I think it was Paul Dinger Jr. who said this first, like, that probably is valuable to other teams who are in a similar situation as the Bengals were this time last year. And the Jets are the perfect example of that. A guy or a team with a quarterback entering his second year, a young head coach who's looking for leaders in that locker room. I don't know what the Jets sold C.J. Uzama with. I don't know if it was just money, but it is a damning loss to the Bengals locker room and a damning loss to our own Bridget as well. He was my heart and soul. Um, and I'll 
I'll, I'll pay a tiny tribute to him later. But I was curious, does anybody know, did the Bengals get any type of deal in front of him or did the Jets just make him an offer he couldn't refuse? Jake might have the sources on that because I do not. Uh, that's not clear to me from what I've heard. I know that they're disappointed that he's gone elsewhere. I think that they expected that they would have a chance to bring him back. I, I think maybe they just knew maybe he told them the offer that he had from the jets and they knew they weren't going there but i I, all i can tell you is that they're disappointed um that they're a little bummed about it but you know you got to move on and they're going to have to find a tight end that can do some of what he did but the locker room replacement you know the raw raw guy i'm not sure where that's going to come from they'll have to find that because i think it does matter at least to some degree it does but it's also money that they still have to spend and it very well could be spent on another offensive lineman. And the one that everybody and their mothers wants right now is a guy who's not even available in Lyle Collins. This goes back to last week when he was rumored to be starting to be shopped by the Dallas Cowboys on the surface. Oh my God, it's a high quality right tackle who's Still 28 years old. He's got three years left on his deal. Not only that, but basically it's just three $10 million team options. None of it is guaranteed. It's just basically cash that he gets paid throughout the year. Why are the Cowboys shopping this guy? Like, why is he on the trade market? Well, it's because they need cap space and whatnot. But then as the last week has progressed, we've started to learn a little bit more about that. Fans wanted to sacrifice high draft picks to get this guy and apparently the Cowboys have received nothing even remotely close to that. They're basically, at this point, willing to take any draft capital that comes their way. And in all likelihood, as of this recording, he is likely to be released before the league year starts on Wednesday afternoon to save whatever whatever cap space that they can. Bengals fans have talked about this topic ad nauseum, so really, we don't really need to go too far into it. So, Jake, what do you think is going to happen with Lyle and... Does that involve the Bengals at least making an offer once he gets out onto the free agent market? Yeah, I think the date to watch, it might not actually be before the start of the new league year, John, although it it certainly could be. I think that we'll see a lot of formal transactions happen on Wednesday. But the, the date for Lyle Collins is five days after the new league year. Some percentage, I think five, six million dollars of his salary becomes guaranteed. And so... That would make it, I think, the 21st, five days after the league year, around the 21st, when some of that money becomes guaranteed. And that puts Dallas on the hook for that cash. And that's money that they do not have to spend, as I understand it, if he's traded. So that would be the deadline for them to make a decision. Maybe they decide they want to keep him because $10 million a year, although it's a bigger cap hit for Dallas, in cash for a quality right tackle is not so bad. But it sounds like having given his agent permission to seek a trade that ship has probably sailed i think they're still interested in bringing in an edge rusher so it seems more likely than not to me that he will eventually be released or traded i guess the other new thing john is the this rumored interest that the patriots have they traded they're a a really good player in Shaq mason to the to the uh tom brady's down in tampa bay for a fifth round pick which I'll never understand, but if it's to clear cap space for Lyle Collins, well, that that could be part of it. And if if the Bengals lose Lyle Collins to a trade that ends up happening to the New England Patriots, depending on the draft compensation, I could be upset. I could be mad on the internet, John, if if that's what mm-hmm. happens, but we'll see. I think more likely is he ends up being released and then the Bengals have to vie for his services and we'll see what kind of contract he attracts because with these guys that get cut, the JC Treaders of Brian Bulaga's, the Daryl Williams is the potential Lyle Collins is it's a lot harder to gauge their market when they've been released instead of just coming off of a, a regular contract here and being an unrestricted free agent. Jake Lisko getting enraged, red the face, smoke coming out of his ears is no better endorsement for me to subscribe to the Locked On Bengals podcast on YouTube or maybe just listen to it on audio if you're not ready for that visual. But Bridget, I, I feel like a lot of fans just respect Frank Pollock, the offensive line coach, and they trust his word on everything. And there's no greater connection that the Bengals have 
other than Frank Pollock that they know his agent, Collins' uh, agent, very well um, because he's the same agent that represented Adam Pacman Jones and represents Joe Mixon. But Pollock seems to be like the link here that no other team has because he coached Lyle in Dallas. Like, should we just trust whatever Frank says? Like, if he still vouches for Lyle, then we have to assume the Bengals are going to make some type of an effort here. But if Lyle goes someplace else, does that kind of mean that it was basically Frank saying, yeah, he's good, but maybe not worth what he's asking for? We've got to trust that a little bit, right? I mean, I don't know if we put all our eggs in that basket, but I think we have to trust that someone in our coaching staff. I would hope after the season we just had, when we saw our coaching staff, when we saw Zach Taylor, Lou Anarumo, uh, Brian Callahan, Frank Pollock, like step up and, and well, <laughs> the O-line, I guess that had a little bit more work to do, but it, let's trust them. Um, and I, I always think there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes than, uh, the, the rest of us get access to. So I trust it. Um, it's, you know, it's always easy to uh, do the Monday quarterbacking. So <laughs> I, I take his word for it. it. It sounds like the Bengals have at least inquired that that contact with Dallas has been made. They they've had some sort of discussion i don't know how long ago that was i've also heard that it's more about money than it is about the player a lot of people are throwing around character speculation with lyle collins he had the hip injury he has had some uh he had at least one suspension and of course there was the the uh police investigation that pushed him out of the draft entirely so People have brought that up, but from what I've heard, it, it sounds like it's more of a money thing than Dallas actually believing Terrence Steele is better than Lyle Collins at tackle. Peace of mind is very important, and it feels like maybe they're just the league is itself is not at that comfort level with acquiring Lyle Collins at that price with that contract or just giving up any draft capital at all. And you know what's more important than peace of mind, Jake? Absolutely nothing. And that is exactly what NordVPN is here for, to give you peace of mind while you are online, either getting mad at a Lyle Collins trade or talking to some non-puppets for the first time on the show. And with all the threats that you face today on the internet, it is more important than ever to be sure that you have the best VPN that you can get. NordVPN is the world's best VPN service, offering the fastest connectivity, most servers, and next-gen encryption to make sure that everything you do online stays secure. Plus... You can use NordVPN on all of your computers and devices, no matter the operating system. With NordVPN's unlimited bandwidth, you never have to worry about a slow connection either. And plans start at under $4 per month. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash believe or use the code believe, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get up 70% off your NordVPN plan, plus one additional month for free. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guaranteed Use it to stay up to date on all the Lyle Collins rumors and everything else going on in Bengals free agency. Well, John, we, we nailed the, these. We nailed these. I, I think we did too. You know what? I mean, who, who needs Daddy on Hoji, honestly? Exactly. But we did tease a little bit earlier, um, Bridget. If you want to kind of pour one out for our, our boy CJ, the floor is yours. Um, and I am shamelessly giggling at the. He, he was more than a nice tight end. Um, so Christopher James Uzama, as you said, John, joined the Bengals uh, in the fifth round of the 2015 draft. And, you know, John, you, you, you did steal a couple of my talking points. So we'll talk about that later. Um, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but you know he was he he was quiet at first, right? We had a strong tight end core uh, in in twenty fifteen, especially Tyler Eifert was he, he was the loud tight end and the one we were all watching. But Uzama was that that consistent player who, while he wasn't always making big plays, he was present. But this was the year of Uzama, and I think what he gave to Bengals fans this year was a was the ability to believe. And I, I know so many of us um, this summer during training camp, we were all like, why not us? Uh, our, our quarterback is back. We've got Jamar Chase. We've got a lot of really exciting players. I think he coined the term Joey franchise. Is that right? 
maybe I, someone can fact check me later. Um, but he helped us believe when it felt hard. He was our media darling. I mean, I know I personally am hoping he is moving to New York to Mary Kay Adams. Um, and on Twitter, I have totally volunteered to be the flower girl at their wedding and would love to see that at a NFL marriage happen. Um, but I, I was kind of reflecting back on CJ season and he remember he had the two touchdown game against the Ravens on national tight end day. And I think that's just like the perfect, um, it's just the perfect synopsis of CJ season. He helped us. What I think uh, could have been a maybe somewhat humiliating defeat on Thursday night football against the Jaguars. He had that, I think it was another two touchdown game and brought us home that went or brought us that win at home uh, on Thursday night football. And there were a lot of plays CJ made this year that, that got us into the postseason. And it, I think what so many of us will always remember is CJ on the dais uh, right before night before they left for LA ripping off his leg brace and like, I, I'm playing this, this is a Super Bowl and I'm here for you Cincinnati. So um, CJ has meant so much to this team, to Bengals fans. And what I think is super cool about CJ Uzama is People are sad he is leaving, but what I saw on social media is just so many people wishing him well. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, Daddio is not here to capitalize on us wishing CJ well. So we'll appreciate that for uh, for this episode. Uh, but we are, uh, we at the Number One Bengals podcast are thanking CJ for all he has done for the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, it's been one hell of a ride in wishing him well as he goes on to the Jets and we'll see him next season. Yeah, Daddy may not be here to capitalize on that, but he must respect that CJ Uzama is now earned about 44 million in career earnings, all from being a fifth round pick out of Auburn who didn't have a position coach in college to start from third string behind both Tyler Eifert and Tyler Croft. It's now being a starting tight end for two NFL teams. Absolutely all the best to CG Uzama. Jake, any final thoughts about first wave of free agency for the Bengals and where they kind of go from here? Yeah, I think that right tackle is a big one that is a starter that I expect them to sign. And and I also think cornerback too is an obvious one, but on the CJ Uzama thought train here, while we're talking about him, I think that the contributions he made to this team need to be replaced on the field. I think off the field that will have, have to happen organically. That will have to happen on its own. But what the Bengals can do to try to replace his on-field contributions is find a tight end with some explosion to his game. CJ Uzama for, for, whatever you think of him had some really explosive plays that won the Bengals games or were huge factors in winning them games. He was as Paul Daner jr. Likes to say, and I think I've said independently too, I agree with him either way that the sneaky yards after catch that developed in his game this year, that the safety blanket on third downs at times, the Bengals will need to replace that stuff on the field too. So I, I think that they're going to, because of how long it takes rookie tight ends to develop, try to find a guy with some athleticism to his game, some speed to his game who can catch. And and CJ could really do it all. He was a decent blocker as well. So in many ways, he'll need to be replaced both for the fans and for the team on the field. And so those are the three positions that I think they're going to be prioritizing. And we'll see where that leaves them in the draft, but it should leave them in a place where they're fairly flexible at, at pick 31, where things are a lot murkier than they are at number five or at number one as they have been the last couple of years. Wow, guys. We just made through an entire show without Daddio, without Hoji. I like I feel I I could kind of get used to this, honestly. Like, you know, I, I I miss those guys. You know, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if I could hear one of their voices, maybe even to close out the show. But honestly, I feel like we handled this pretty well. You know, we're very smooth, no interruptions. No cringe, I hope not. No potential diplomacy issues with anywhere else going on in the world right now. I feel like we we, we handled that pretty well. What do you think, Courtney? Yeah, pretty impressed. You guys got it. I mean, who needs them, right? Senior intern, you may be up for a promotion. 
I don't know about that. That, that comes that comes with extra money, and I don't think that's honestly in the budget. The Bengals may spend up to the cap, but this show definitely needs some more work on that. But if you want to hear more future shows from this great channel, the number one Bengals podcast, you can find us on YouTube at DNH Sports. Anywhere you get your podcast, you got Spotify, you got Stitcher, you got Google Play, you got Apple, you got those podcast forms. The number one Bengals podcast, and you can follow us on. You can not follow us, maybe follow us there, but you can be a part of our Patreon. Go to Patreon.com/slash/DNHSports. You can subscribe to us on YouTube again on DNH Sports. I feel like I already said that. I haven't really gone through all this. I probably need to script this a little bit more, but that is where you can find. All of our stuff, Bridget. Any final thoughts? I think that's it. We we did it. I know. I know, folks. Miss the puppets. The puppets will be back. John, Maybe. we might have to do a side show, but the puppets are coming back. We'll we'll go drag them out. Do I, I mean we've been speculating about where where they are, but I, I think they're coming back. Well, again, like he didn't. He, I actually just have breaking news. Breaking news. I just have uh, an update on their whereabouts. Would you guys like to see? Yes, this would be more information than I know. Yes, please tell. This is Dr. Hoji, the Electric Smochi, coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains where I have undertaken a spiritual retreat. Really, you know, getting away from the, the daily grind of living in my Malibu mansion, signing envelopes here. I breathe in that pure oxygenated air. I, I contemplate, uh, you know, the, the absolute beauty of nature as well as the nature of absolute nothingness. News has been trickling and I've tried to avoid it. I heard about Ted Karras coming to the Bengals from the Patriots. Alex Kappa, great signing from the Bucks. I've also heard the bad news. CJ Uzama, man, you will be missed. What a great guy. But still, the conclusion I've come to is that I, just like I'm here in the mountains, I need to let go. I need to stop worrying about the offensive line. Stop worrying about this. The next Super Bowl, the coming year. Listen, things will change and they're going to change with or without me years ago i didn't know who logan wilson was but now i couldn't live without him years ago you know i i thought we should sign a great kicker but everyone disagreed when when management wanted to and it turned out to be a, a great decision i didn't i didn't think chase was the right choice for for the number one pick, pick. he was the, the the first round pick but he was the right choice you know, the universe just keeps moving. And, and at best, I'm an observer. So you know what? I'm just going to keep observing these Bengals. They're in good hands. How could they have known that we'd need to win so many games by just one field goal so they would make sure to sign McPherson? I don't know. I'm just observing and I'm going to keep observing. I'm going to stop worrying and just enjoy being a Bengals fan. And that, that is my hojoscope. You know, this is not the first time that Hoji has taken an unexpected vacation without informing me or anyone else on the show. But at least, at the very least, he was able to provide us some content. We're going to have to get another chat with him. It's free agency. Why is he in the mountains? We, didn't, we don't even know where Daddy was at this point. I thought we'd get more clarification on that. Yeah, but worse yet, we, we are missing Daddy up. But We'll figure that out later. Jake, tell the kind folks at home where they can follow you and all of your work. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at Jake Lisco, J A K E L I S C O W, the W silent. And the Locked On Bengals podcast is where I am every day, sometimes multiple times a day, for all the latest on your Cincinnati Bengals. Good enough for me. For Jake Lisco, silent W. For my co host, Bridget, I am John Sheeran. This has been the number one Bengals podcast. We will see you next time. So long, sweetie. Eyes.